investments. You all buy individual mutual funds and pay 5% charge at the beginning and 1.5 plus charges every year. And of course, people, it's not surprising that people have bad experiences with their mutual funds here, and so they leave the money with what? With the government at 4%. And then they're surprised that when they retire, they don't have much money. Sad, but true. Now, I could go to the exchange and say, I don't you promote it. Well, we try. But the exchange is there to make fees on trading, not to promote specific instruments. And of course, the other people have a direct interest in promoting turnover, individual stocks, etc., etc., because they're paid by commissions. I'll have something to say on commissions later. Sorry if I get emotional, but um, <laughs> I, I hate to be taken advantage of, and I hate to see friends and good, hard-working people taking being taken advantage of. Bit broader perspective. What's the evidence on international segmentation? Because markets are segmented to a certain extent, and that means that's part of the reason for this lack of correlation. There is what I just mentioned, the so-called home equity basis. It's not only Singaporeans who have most of their money, equity money, in Singaporean counters. Uh, if you go every country, mo almost all investors have almost all their money in local shares. Even within Europe, they have it in individual national markets. Now, there are various uh, academic explanations why that is so. Maybe it's due to multinationals provide indirect diversification, which is, which is not true, really true, because as I just mentioned to you, empirical work clearly shows that multinationals will not diversify your portfolio. The multinationals still work, follow, have a high correlation with their general local market. So a Dow Chemical, which I used to work for the Treasury Department, they have 50% of their assets and activities outside of the US. However, the stock still moves in high correlation with the domestic US market. Uh, it may be due to consumption. We'll take, talk about consumption a little bit more. Uh, the real return, of course, depends on where an investor lives, and that is true. The pricing of securities with respect to domestic factors after computing betas, that's the correlation with the market in general, and alphas, that's the outperformance vis-a-vis -vis the world market portfolio. Domestic factors are still priced in. Maybe it's due to indirect barriers, which may well be because in Singapore we see the international diversification, if you want to actually do it, and we'll talk about it, is not as easy as one would expect it from an international financial center. Maybe it's due to purchasing power deviations. That's a very theoretical point, and I won't even go into that. Um, how can we internationalize our portfolio? Let's do something practical. The direct way, of course, if you have enough money and time and connections, you can start having brokerage accounts in a number of countries. Actually, you don't need that many. You need one in the US, and you need one in Europe, in London probably, and that sets you up pretty well. You can buy, in all those markets, there are so-called ADRs or GDRs. Those are nothing else but listed stocks, foreign stocks that are listed on those exchanges. Use the US example, you find a number of Singaporean stocks that are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. I think Singtel is, and a number of others are too. So, living in the US, if I wanted to invest in a Singapore counter, I don't have to open a brokerage account here. I can simply buy it in the US, that particular stock, or even better, there's a Singapore index fund that I've now, I've now had for 20 years plus, uh, which is the much easier way because I don't have to think about which of the counters a uh, few hundred counters that are traded here, I should buy. I simply buy the Singapore index one. So the same is true for Singaporeans. You can simply open up nowadays, and I'll show you which uh, accounts that if, if you don't know it already. Uh, the US market is easily acceptable. Europe, for some reason, is a real headache. If you want to buy 
bonds in euros or a European bond fund because I think it makes sense to get some exposure in euros here it is surprisingly difficult anyway you can buy mutual funds you can buy exchange traded funds on indexes you can have it onshore offshore there are various mutual funds we don't have to go into that after what I said before uh, nothing needs to be said anymore I don't buy mutual funds I work for them um, <laughs> It's just like options. I teach them, I don't buy them. <laughs> Multinational companies, as we already mentioned, those give you some diversification, but not enough. And we talked about productive assets, buying a firm, buying a house in California or something like that. Doesn't make much sense. Uh, however, new opportunities for, for uh, individual investors, fortunately, now abound. And uh, there are some interesting things coming up. And I only tell, as I said, I'm, I'm not a licensed uh, investment advisor. All I tell you here is what I personally do. You can follow that or not, but that's completely up to you. Uh, for example, I don't know which bonds to buy here. But they have an ABF Singapore bond index fund here, which uh, has a very low charge basically you buy a portfolio and you don't have to worry about reinvesting the bonds reinvesting the dividends once you get in the men I can tell you the manager of the ABF Singapore bond fund they get their dividends on time not with a 10-day delay um, there are allegedly you can uh, you can uh, buy the uh, the Dow Jones industrial average which is 30 US stocks you can buy gold shares, which is the only index fund that sells, uh, that has some significant turnover, it's funny. And I think because it is cheaper to do that than driving up to Genting or waiting for the integrated resort to arrive finally. Um, but seriously, a gold, a gold index fund, I have none and I cannot recommend it. If I want some exposure to precious metals makes sense, but then buy the mining shares. Buy some Aussie mining shares that'll give you all the exposure that you want in that particular thing. And in my view, for the normal, typical Singapore pensioners among which I count myself, 5% of your portfolio is plenty. Um, gold is nice, it puts, if it's in the right form, glitters in the eyes of ladies. Uh, but uh, as an investment, it's not terribly interesting. But there's lots of activities in the price. The papers write about it, and so it's exciting. But not as a game, not as an investment. Um, the various, the various uh, indices, again, that is traded the Singapore EWS. I, li I happen to like the, the Straits Times Index because that consists of of 100 shares, and I don't have to worry about which shares in Singapore to buy. And there is even some activity in the market. You get a price that is reasonably that is reasonable. Now the other the others listed here, and I had my assistant put those together. They are relatively new. Uh, they are less than a year old, and I must say I have no experience with them. Perhaps somebody can comment uh, to me afterwards. I haven't seen them. Uh, China, of course, is of interest to all of us, but again, I would warn you, because we are so dependent on China in many ways. Just imagine, how will your firm do during the China crash of 2009? How will you do during the China crash of 2009? I'm joking. <laughs> uh, but only half, because no country has ever grown at 10% forever. If you look at China more detailed, anybody you want to do business there or have done business there, this there is a lot of bad investment built in. All the Chinese banks have so many bad loans that the government has to take them out occasionally. Uh, China, I think, is an interesting proposition. Some of my best friends are PRC Chinese. I love to hire them here as assistants. They're great. 